madam for the continuation of academic program so we'll move on to the second talk of today of today and the second talk is by the dr pradeep chandran sir see the surveillance medical officer of who uh, he will be talking to us about uh, vaccine preventable disease surveillance program what is new the vaccine preventable disease surveillance is an integral part of a uh, immunization program where we need to know the uh, in what uh, the incidence of vaccine preventable disease and whenever we have a vaccine preventable disease um, uh, and uh, we uh, sir, uh, sir is very familiar to us whenever we have a vaccine preventable disease we inform sir and by just by one message i will take up the case and will complete the reporting i request sir to uh, give us a talk on the topic thank you ma'am for the nice words uh, respected teachers my friends in iap uh, after a very wonderful current topic by dr bennett uh, please adopt legally this topic which is not that hot um, okay can you share my screen yes sir is the screen visible yes sir okay so the topic for the day is bpd surveillance mm. you want to eradicate a disease eliminate a disease control a disease there are few basic steps the most important for any vaccine preventable disease the first step is immunize the second early identification control the spread for that surveillance is the major one and the third will be managing that particular case to save that child so these are some of the basic steps for any condition any vaccine preventable disease control elimination or even eradication many of the young pediatricians they have not seen this or none of the young pediatricians have seen this this is what polio can do to a child and this and this none of the young pediatricians have seen this but these are all two things that happen and it is happening even during our house agency and post graduate days but now you may not have seen this these are iron lungs olden age uh, ventilator equivalents and another one almost everyone in that family got wiped out because of one vaccine preventable disease diphtheria a simple vaccine would have prevented this and this happened in 1800s it continued in 1900 also another family so in this background our surveillance becomes very important immunization we should concentrate at the same time with the same importance we should pursue surveillance also at present we have five diseases coming under the bpd surveillance the first and the most important is for polio that is afp surveillance then for measles rubella earlier it was mr surveillance now it is fever rash surveillance then for diphtheria pertussis and neonatal tetanus and for polio what we have is an afp surveillance or acute placid paralysis surveillance under this surveillance we need to report any sudden onset of weakness or floppiness in a child under 15 years of age irrespective of the part of the body irrespective of the associated symptoms irrespective of the immunization status of the child even a borderline case even an ambiguous case even a transient paralysis it is to be reported maybe we can say only two exceptions for not reporting one if it is more than 6 months the onset of paralysis is more than 6 months it's not an acute case anymore no need to report and the second if there is any element of spasticity or rigidity no need to report every other weakness in a child even when the tone is normal even when the reflexes are retained still if there is any kind of paralysis please do report immediately if the child is above or if the person is above 15 years only if the clinician is suspecting polio then only it should be reported and when you report a case this is what we do the sample collected is stool we need to collect two stool samples within 14 days from the onset of paralysis ideally up to 60 days or 2 months we do collect samples and these two samples should be minimum 24 hours apart a minimum quantity of 8 grams or adult thumb size and it should be shifted 
to an WHO accredited lab in a cold chain, in a reverse cold chain, two to eight degrees. And the accredited lab for Kerala is NIV, Bangalore. So we need to send that sample. And the sa lab will process the sample for uh, wild virus, vaccine virus, VDPVs, and other enterovirus. Then only they give a negative certificate for that. And these are the criteria to say that once sa uh, stool samples are adequate. And for measles and rubella, we have earlier we had MR surveillance. And now, since last two months, government has changed MR surveillance to fever rash surveillance. This is a very major change. Earlier, we used to report any person, irrespective of the age, with fever and maculopapular rash, and one of the three C's, like cough, coryza, or conjunctivitis. In the present fever rash surveillance, this criteria has been taken out. There is no cough, coryza, conjunctivitis criteria. So any person with fever and maculopapular rash, irrespective of your diagnosis, your diagnosis can be dengue, can be chikungunya, it can be measles, it can be rubella, it can be uh, maybe mis. But when someone has a fever and a macular rash, it is to be reported as suspected uh, uh, measles uh, rubella or even a fever rash a syndrome. Or any person in whom a clinician suspects measles or rubella is to be uh, reported. And this was the criteria for rubella reporting. Again, fever with rash and lymphadenitis, arthralgia, or arthritis. Now that criteria has been taken out. Now it's only any person. So any person with fever and maculopapular rash is to be reported for fever rash surveillance. This is a major change in uh, MR elimination surveillance. And the samples collected. For any fever rash case reported, we collect two sets of samples. One is a serum sample. And it can be collected up to 28 days from the date of onset of rash. And this sample goes to NIV, Alapura. Only for Trivandrum, the sample goes to State Public Health Lab. And they do IgM for measles and rubella. And we can collect the sample up to 28 days and it to treat the lab uh, in, again in a cold chain, two to eight degrees centigrade. And the second sample is for virological study. And the ideal sample will be a throat swab or an esopharyngeal swab. If it is not available or if it is difficult to take the sample in a very small child, then you can go for a urine sample, which is not that productive as a throat swab. But this can be collected only up to seven days. With this sample, they do an RT-PCR. And if it's a throat swab, it should read the lab in a transport medium, which is a viral transport medium, the same transport medium which we use for uh, COVID uh, testing. And all the other districts give it to NAV Alabama, except Trivandrum. For Trivandrum, we have State Public Health Lab as an accredited lab. And this is what the lab do. Whenever there is a serum sample, they run it for uh, IgM measles first. If it's confirmed, if it is positive, it's a confirmed case of measles. If it is negative, they run it for rubella IgM. And if that's positive, it's a confirmed case of rubella. If both measles and rubella IgM are negative, then they uh, report it as a negative sample, then that case becomes a non-measles, non-rubella exam. And for diphtheria, if a clinician suspects diphtheria, it is to be reported. Otherwise, this is a criteria, a laryngitis, or pharyngitis or tonsillitis with an adherent membrane of tonsil pharynx and or nose. And this is to be reported as diphtheria. And for every case of uh, suspected diphtheria reported, we need to collect two throat swab. Uh, more the number of swabs, uh, more the chance of isolation of organism. Once you collect the swab, it should be transported to state public health lab, which is accredited lab in two to eight degrees centigrade and in a transport medium. And the transport medium which we use in Kerala, it's AMIS transport medium. Uh, without a transport medium, if it is shifted to the lab, by the time it reaches lab, if the swab dries out, we cannot process the sample. So that's the importance of transport medium. And please make sure that we are using the correct transport medium. For example, if you take a diphtherial swab and put it in a viral transport medium, by the time it reaches the lab, there won't be anything. So the correct transport medium is also very important. Similarly, to take the throat swab, ideally be a Dacron or a polyester swab. If you use a cotton swab, it might interfere with the RT-PCR test. And for pertussis, if a clinician suspects pertussis or pertussoid cough, immediately it should be uh, reported. Otherwise, these are the criteria. A person of any age with a cough lasting for more than two weeks or of any duration in an infant or in a person in an outbreak setting, 
in an outbreak setting, if somebody else has got us in that area, no need to wait for two weeks of coughing before reporting. You can uh, put it as a suspected uh, pertussis. And with one of the following, like paroxysms of cough, inspiratory whoop, postussy vomiting, or apnea in an infant. So in that case, the sample collected is a nasopharyngeal swab and a serum sample. Two samples are collected. One is a serum sample, and it can be collected up to 12 weeks. After two weeks of cough, onset of cough, up to 12 weeks, we can collect the sample. And from the serum sample, lab will be doing an IgG. And we need to take a nasopharyngeal swab, not a throat swab. We should take a nasopharyngeal swab. And it should read the lab in a transport medium. The transport medium for purposes, what we use is a regal or transport medium. And again, these samples will reach uh, the state public health lab. And for neonatal tetanus, this, these are the criteria for reporting neonatal tetanus. One, a newborn with a normal ability to suck and cry during the first two days of life, becomes stiff or have convulsions or spasm and cannot suck normally between three to 28 days of age. Or a child died of an unknown cause during the first month of life. Even that is to be reported as suspected neonatal tetanus. Later, after investigation, maybe we'll rule out uh, for some other uh, etiology. And no samples needed. Okay, why every case is to be reported? It's uh, unlike in clinical pediatrics, whenever a case is reported, actually we are not managing that case. We are not just taking the sample and sending it to the lab and just confirming or uh, discarding it as a case. Same time, other things also happen. The most important thing, we track all the contacts and line list them. Whether it's diphtheria, whether it's pertussis, whether it's measles, whether it's rubella, whatever. Or for all the cases, we uh, track all the contacts and line list them. And at the same time, we do an active case search in the locality, in all the houses, nearby houses, or in that ward or village for additional cases. Then we try to prevent that case becoming an outbreak in that area by doing timely intervention like outbreak response immunization for diphtheria. In any child who is left out or dropped out will be immunized with uh, either uh, PENTA, DPT, TD, or whatever age appropriate wax. If in an adult, if that, that person has not received any vaccine for the past uh, five years or more, that person, so that way we give an outbreak response immunization. Then we do chemoprophylaxis. If it's a diphtheria case or if it's a pertussis, all the contacts will be given chemoprophylaxis, whether erythromycin, azithromycin, whatever, as per the guidelines. And at the same time, we isolate, isolate uh, the patient and maybe we quarantine some of the uh, contacts. And most important, we create an awareness in the community, among the public. Because anybody with a sore throat, if they have a diphtheria in that area, if they know that they, there is a diphtheria in that area, they might go to a doctor rather than go to a pharmacy and get some drugs. Similarly, a doctor, if he knows that there is diphtheria cases reported in that area, before writing some antibiotic for a person complaining of sore throat, at least they will ask that person to open the mouth and put some torch and see whether there is a membrane or a patch. So that awareness also. Uh, so these are things that happen when you report a case, not that we just uh, see that case, collect sample, uh, get a report and discard. These are things that happen in the background when a, even as for a single case that's uh, reported for any of these uh, VPDs. Okay, then what are the challenges? It looks very simple, but we have lots of issues. One, getting the case reported in time. Many a times fever rash cases, are, lots of fever rash cases are happening but we don't get the cases reported. Maybe they know that it's measles or they know that it's a transient rash or they know that it is a misc or maybe it's something else. So it's not getting reported. Second, paralty cases. If it's a facial, I know it's a Bell's palsy, why should I? Or maybe I have done all the nerve conduction studies and cytoalbin disproportion, so it's a GBS, why should I? No, for this, it's a syndromic approach. So getting the case reported, that's the first challenge. Second, once you report a case, uh, Investigations should be done at the earliest so that we don't miss out on any of the clinical findings. And the most challenging part will be the sample collection. We need to collect the sample within that proper time window. For that, we need the proper reporting, correct timely reporting, and we need to have the timely investigation. Then only we can collect the samples within that uh, uh, time frame. And we need to have the adequate sample. And another challenge will be the shipment of the sample. You have collected the sample, you have taken the serum, you are taking the throat swab, you are taking nasopharyngeal swab. One, there should be a proper packing. We have instances where 
the samples have been collected, it has been sent to the lab. But by the time it reaches the lab, the entire sample has leaked out because they forgot to uh, screw cap the uh, bottle tightly. Very simple mistake, but all the effort done so far, it goes waste. You have taken a throat swab, but you didn't put it in a uh, transport medium. You have taken a throat swab or an acephalmil, you put it in a wrong transport medium. All these things will affect. Even a simple thing like not labeling the sample bottle. The lab receives hundreds of samples per day. If your sample is not labeled for the lab, it's an unknown sample, they will not process it. So these are small things and sending the lab uh, sample to an accredited lab. You have taken a sample and you sent it to your um, uh, hospital lab or to a, a private lab. Okay, that's fine maybe for you. But as far as the national program is concerned, the report should be from an accredited lab, then only it has a value. So we need to know to which lab it's to be sent. And all the documentation, this is also important because in that regard also, we need some uh, support uh, from you. Then, uh, so what's the request to each one of you? This is the request to each one of you for a very good surveillance or a very strong surveillance in our state, especially now, because since last two years, our routine immunization have dipped like anything. All of you know, uh, from 93%, full immunization coverage has come down to 83%. In some pockets, it has even less than 70%. That's one thing. Now schools are opening up. Now theaters are opening up. So people have started moving out. So this is the time when we anticipate some trouble as far as VPD is concerned. So at this point, this is very crucial. So request will be, please do report any suspected case as per this definition, or even when you suspect it, none of the things fits in, but you feel that it's a case of uh, penalty case, or if it's a, it's a diphtheria or supportosis or a measles or rubella, please do report immediately. And second, support in sample collection. This is very important because you have a child uh, comes to your clinic or to a hospital. You are treating as an OP. You have reported. Unless you tell them, even if our team goes to the field and uh, requests for a sample, sample collection, even if it's a stool sample, they may not. They may not. Basically, we are all paranoid. And now this paranoia is a little more also. So unless you give them a clue that, okay, somebody will come, please do give the samples. That's one thing. And second, for the fever rash, we need serum sample. It's very difficult to collect serum sample, even in a hospital set up in a small site. So it's almost out of question doing it in the field. So the request will be, anyway, the fever rash child will come to a hospital. Any child or any patient that comes to your place, you might take the uh, blood sample for the routine investigation. So the request will be take one ml of serum from that child, label it and keep it in the fridge so that we can avoid that painful procedure, painful both for the child, the parents, the bystanders, and even for the, uh, our health team who is going out there, we can avoid that. And the last thing will be support in case investigation and documentation. Most part of the case, it's a very simple one pager. It's a very simple one pager, but the issue is some of the things can be filled only by a medical officer. So at that point, for our health team, just help them out in uh, 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 filling up that tone, uh, reflexes, uh, those part. So these are the small things which can help the servants in a very big way. And again, the request will be report the current illness, even the history of illness. For example, a child comes to you with a cough or a diarrhea, and the mother says last week child had fever and rash. Report that. Even up to three months backdated cases can be reported, even though we can collect the sample only up to 28 days. Even borderline ambiguous or even doubtful cases, especially in an AFP case. Child is limping, but the reflexes are retained. Tone is okay. You don't know why child is limping. It's a myalgia, maybe neuritis, maybe it's your diagnosis, synovitis. But when you take an X-ray or an ultrasound or a scan, there's no fluid. Please do report. So borderline and this even transient paralysis, please do report. So uh, why we want? We are not looking for the case per se. We are not uh, keen on that particular child. We are for a bigger cause. We are looking for the virus uh, transmission. We are looking for elimination or eradication of the condition. So even when you are in doubt, please do report so that we can collect the samples within that time frame. If it's something else, we can always discard that case. Uh, but if the reporting is delayed then the sample collection uh, gets affected. So this is what happens in a surveillance. We have lots of patients. Some of them have uh, the symptoms like we mentioned. Please do report so that they come in the surveillance net. So we do take the sample and test it. So we know which is a case and which is a discarded one. Okay, so that's my request. If you happen to find any of these cases, please do report immediately. 
please do repent. Please don't wait for a confirmation. Please don't wait for a lab report from your lab. Please do report immediately, either to the district RCH officer or directly to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pradevalan, sir, for this uh, excellent presentation. Sir has actually told us what are the, uh, the um, uh, conditions where you need to report and uh, how to report also. Um, we will all take up uh, your advice and report cases as and when they come to our OPD and clinics. Thank you. Uh, and now both topics are open for discussion. There are a few questions in the chat box. I will start with that. Uh, there's a question that is, uh, can prospective adoptive parents select to reject a particular child before adoption? Definitely, they can uh, they can select or reject. Uh, the, the, the child will be shown to the parents, ad uh, prospective adoptive parents, and uh, if they are not interested with the child, definitely they can select or reject. There is no confusion. Uh, there is another question that whether the child can reject or adopt uh, or uh, accept a prospective couple. That it is another child. Surprise, I am not very sure about it. But usually the children are less than five years and all. They don't do like it. But uh, definitely this question, I am not sure about it. Whether the older child they can adopt, accept or reject. I'm not sure. Sir, as uh, you said that uh, rates of adoption is now decreasing. Over the years, there is a decrease in the number of adoptions. It's happening in our country. Uh, what is the cause for this? Is it due to decrease in the number of uh, children who are eligible to be adopted or decrease in the uh, prospective parents? Exact cause, we don't know. But uh, maybe last year, because of maybe because of the COVID scenario, uh, the, uh, the adoption process itself got delayed. That is the last two years situation. But the trend is definitely down, uh, downgrade only. And exact cause, we don't know. Maybe because of the poor awareness and and our uh, sensitization may be low. That may be the reason. Yeah, these were the questions. And, uh, that... Maybe one more reason can be more and be more people are going for infertile treatment because the facilities are now more and uh, the institutions are giving a lot of hope to the infertile couples that you will get a child if you come to me like that situation also can be there exact reason we don't know we have always heard that there is a waiting list of parents for adoption is it uh, like that uh, even nowadays it is true it is true because of the pro uh, procedure delay that is yeah. there a lot of waiting in this uh, personally i got a chat from musket also uh, asking for uh, they waited for three years and it just got expired but uh, that senior will be maintained that will not be any problem and they but they have to may have to update again yes. uh, there should have been uh, uh, both the talks are uh, excellent, uh, uh, Bennett, and uh, that is highly uh, informative. A lot of uh, uh, information I have. Uh, uh, Pradhaban, I have uh, two doubts. Uh, one thing, we covered uh, MR vaccination in Kerala, almost 76 lakhs. And uh, out of uh, India, 41 crores we are targeted. I don't know how much uh, uh, was the coverage, by, uh, whether we achieved 95% was doubtful. Anyway, in Kerala, it was almost we covered uh, uh, around 90% of the 76 lakhs. At that time, uh, what we left out was above 15. And uh, definitely, they were the eligible people because uh, there is a chance uh, for the age uh, shift of the rubella in the coming years. Nobody take, took any interest to arrange the vaccination for that age group. And now it's almost four more years gone. So my question is whether there is a number of uh, rubella cases increasing among that age group, whether there is an increase in the number of congenital rubella syndrome, who is having the data in state? We don't know. And uh, is there any provision for the surveillance of this age group? 
we are all doing this thing up to 15 years. So what about the communicable diseases, which is shifting to an older age? Whooping cough is shifting to the older age group. Diphtheria, all of us know it's in the, in the, in the older age group, even in the above 60s. So we are all targeting the surveillance for the younger kids less than 15. And only in uh, the clinician or the neurologist suspect they have been like that. But maybe we are missing a lot of all these cases above 15. Is there any provision for including them in this uh, surveillance program? We may be missing it. That's one thing. And another, why you people are ignoring the Sika? Sika, for the last few months, it was there in the news. And once the news it is it's over, nobody's interested. It, it, around 65 cases in Kerala, I was following. And recently, they're in UP and in North India, it's there. And very, very high chance that it is there still in, in Kerala. But why you, are, you people are not at all taking interest in the in uh, how, what is the status now? Isn't that important? Thank you, sir. As always, uh, very pointed, relevant questions from you. Uh, so the first thing uh, regarding the surveillance. Sir, except for AFP surveillance, there is no age restriction. Whether it is uh, fever rash or uh, so-called MR surveillance, VPD surveillance, and of course, not neonatal tetanus. For all the others, there is no age restriction. So we request everyone, including dermatologists, including uh, general medicine, even in ENT people to report cases and ID, ID people in addition to our pediatric uh, uh, fraternity to report cases. So from every case, we do collect samples. That, uh, that is the surveillance uh, guideline. And even in my slides, I showed that there is no age restriction in all the other things. So that's one part of the question. Second, regarding the vaccination. When we introduced MR vaccine, actually there was a, there was a campaign mode as you remember, sir, like we immunize children up to 15 years of age. And only after that, only after that, only we start uh, introduced MR vaccine routine immunization so that uh, we can uh, prevent that age shift and maybe increase incidence of uh, uh, congenital uh, rubella syndrome when those children become uh, I mean, um, eligible couple and when they get uh, uh, pregnant, when they get babies. Okay, so uh, these are the two things. And um, if we can clearly show that there is an age shift, then at the national level or even at the state level, we can plan for another campaign at a different age group. But for that, we need data. That's where we fail. In spite of all these requests, none of the districts, none of the districts, the, the, the minimum criteria to say that there's a good surveillance is two fever rash case per 100,000 population, just two cases per 100,000 population. None of the districts have not even one. The highest what we have for this year is 0.8. So that's the level of reporting what we have. So that's the one big failure. Without data, we cannot say that, okay, there is an age shift and we need vaccination at a higher age group. So if we can prove it, we can show it, definitely we can. That's one part. And second about the Sika. Uh, sir, when that Sika outbreak happened in the state, we had that, as you know, the state level and um, high level committee from government of India and all that. So one of the recommendations we put forth to the government, anyway, we are collecting fever rash case samples. And the labs were willing, both uh, NIV, RAPUR, and state public health, they were willing to do with each serum sample four tests. Measles, rubella, uh, chikungunya, uh, dengue, and Sika. But that time, what happened? We had uh, some shortage of Sika kits. Then they said, we'll do compulsory Sika for all the pregnant women and Sika for those who are negative for all the other four. But unfortunately, these are not accepted by the state. So, but still, we are still pursuing it because anyway, that way, the reporting will also become better. From the big group of OBGs, once this Sika and uh, uh, Sika also comes into this fever rash, they might also report more number of uh, cases. So, still, we are pursuing it. Hopefully, it might come through. Thank you, sir. Bindusha Joji, I was saying, I they can reject. If they children, get, yeah, get. children constantly, if they are saying that I don't want to go with these children, they can reject. Yeah. And, Dr. and Dr. Bennett, uh, yeah, you said um, uh, um, uh, there will be some compatibility determined before adoption. So how much choice uh, do the parents have? Suppose they, they like a child and you say they, they, 
they are not compatible with this parent so how much choice do they have so uh, actually what they do is uh, they will show the child one child the, the first, first question is what child they want you can ask for a uh, for the preference mm-hmm. like male child female male or child female. or no choice both both they can do and if they give a, they ask for a male child definitely they will get a male child only and if they ask for a female child they will get a female child only if they don't give any choice uh, any child who is coming first that will be given and once the and uh, again uh, they can see the child also everything will be online and uh, if they reject they can reject it it is not a problem at all no actually uh, seeing the child online is not possibly uh, good enough so they are to see physically photograph namu kalyanathil kanikkum pole irikkum adu photograph actually <laughs> so my second question is uh, the regarding the illegal adoption uh, suppose we come across any actually i have come across an illegal adoption during my practicing days and uh, it's now about uh, 18 years or maybe more than that so when we come across an illegal adoption suppose we do not report as i have done is it uh, punishable or what this one is punishable sir because uh, we are uh, encouraged like any other situation this one is punishable there is no doubt about it okay now um, uh, dr pratap uh regarding this transport mediums we will not be having a, um, transport mediums in stock like viral bacterial and bacterial itself separate for diphtheria separate for pertussis so i mean are we supposed to stock it or are we supposed to just report and you will come with the uh, transport medium uh, uh, sir uh, actually uh, one of the silver linings of this covid uh, pandemic is that Uh, we do have viral transport medium and swab everywhere and all of us have become experts even our field staff have become experts in taking both nasopharyngeal and throat swab that is one uh, what should i say not good things maybe the silver lining in that big dark cloud of pandemic so that way that transport medium is not an issue sir regarding the other two that enis and the regal or transport medium uh, the issue is Uh, one it should be stored in a cold chain second it has an expiry short expiry hardly maybe around 6 months expiry thing is there that's one reason we are not keeping the uh, transport medium in uh, every hospital but if a major hospital if a teaching hospital like an um, sat hospital or major medical college or where we we might get uh, cases maybe one or two cases per month or something like that we can always uh, keep samples i mean uh, transport medium uh, kits uh, in those uh, hospitals that's not an issue sir we can do that at present it will be available to all the uh, district uh, rch officers so information within within uh, 12 24 hours you will get that uh, transport medium and swab if not within 12 hours and regarding a child dying regard, regarding a child dying within uh, one month without a diagnosis um, suppose we report how do we actually uh, come to the conclusion whether it was neonatal tetanus because basically it is a clinical diagnosis only the person who has seen the child can diagnose it and uh, the person who has seen the child has got no diagnosis then how can we uh, confirm a uh, third person can confirm whether it is a tetanus possible tetanus uh, or not Uh, so <laughs> that's a bouncer um, so but the same thing happens even for afp cases also many times what happens when it is not done at our level or there is some issue like maybe it is not reported in time we couldn't see that child then uh, there is there is a protocol for that for example if this child dies and we are, we are re- reporting as a neonatal status then the immunization status of the mother that will be taken the uh, routine immunization status in that village it will be taken epidemiology of that area this entire document and including whatever clinical records we have whatever little we have entire thing goes to an expert committee and they will be the ones who will be finally deciding whether it could have been a neonatal tetanus or we could rule it out as something else most if if something is there to rule it out most likely they will say that it could have been neonatal tetanus benet nan oru oru 2 years back Yeah. 
ഡോക്ടർ ബെന്നറ്റ് ഒരു 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 എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് ഒരു ടു ഇയേഴ്സ് ബാക്ക് ഉള്ള ഒരു എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് ആണ് അപ്പോ ടു ബ്ലൈൻഡ് പീപ്പിൾ രണ്ടുപേരും കൂടി കല്യാണം കഴിച്ച രണ്ടുപേർക്കും ലോട്ടറി ടിക്കറ്റ് ആണ് അങ്ങനെയാണ് അപ്പോൾ ഹാപ്പി ആയിട്ട് ജീവിച്ചു പോവായിരുന്നു അതിന്റെ എൽഡർ സിബ്ലിംഗ് ഡൈഡ് ഫ്യൂ ഇയേഴ്സ് ബാക്ക് അപ്പൊ അതിന് ഡയഗ്നോസ് ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നില്ല ഒരു സഡൻ ആയിട്ട് സീഷോക്ക് വന്ന് ഡെത്തായി But this child again was admitted with a similar history and uh, at the end uh, it was uh, proved to be a rare diagnosis, necrotizing encephalitis. Mm-hmm. We worked up that case and uh, that was uh, proved to be a uh, genetic basis of the same thing as possible. So, we had to say that the episode of the biotin and metabolic signals of the patient was saved. Mm-hmm. And after some time, over six months, she succumbed to the next episode of similar problem. അപ്പൊ അവർക്ക് രണ്ട് കുട്ടികളും പോയി രണ്ടുപേരും ബ്ലൈൻഡ് ആണ് അപ്പൊ ആ എപ്പിസോഡൊക്കെ കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ട് ഒരു കുറച്ച് നാൾ കഴിഞ്ഞപ്പോ എന്നെ ഭയങ്കരതായിട്ട് അവര് വിളിച്ചു ഫോൺ ചെയ്തു അപ്പോ അവളായിരുന്നു മറ്റേ ഞങ്ങളെ കൊണ്ടാടുന്നോണ്ടിരുന്നത് മൂത്ത കുട്ടിയെ പോയി ഇതും പോയതോടെ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഒന്നും ഇല്ലേണ്ടായി അപ്പോ അവര് ചോദിക്കുന്ന ഒരു കുട്ടീനെ അഡോപ്റ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുമോ അപ്പൊ എന്റെ ചോദ്യം ഇതാണ് അവർക്ക് അമ്പത്തഞ്ച് വയസ്സൊന്നും ആയിട്ടില്ല അവർക്ക് ലോട്ടറി വിറ്റിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു കാര്യമേ ഉള്ളൂ അപ്പൊ ഒരു ഫൈനാൻഷ്യലി ജീവിച്ചു പോവാം അങ്ങനത്തെ സാഹചര്യത്തിന് അവർക്കൊരു കുട്ടിയുടെ കാര്യം ഉണ്ട് എന്നുള്ള സിറ്റുവേഷൻ നമ്മൾ എന്താണ് ഡിസൈഡ് ചെയ്യാം എന്തായാലും ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റില്ല എന്ന് എനിക്കറിയാം അല്ല സർ അത് പറ്റത്തില്ല കാരണം പറഞ്ഞു കഴിഞ്ഞാല് ഫിസിക്കലി മെന്റലി ആൻഡ് ഫിനാൻഷ്യലി സ്റ്റേബിൾ ആയിരിക്കണം അവര് അതില് കൺഫ്യൂഷൻ ഇല്ല കാരണം നമ്മള് ബെനിഫിറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദ ചൈൽഡ് ആണ് നോക്കുന്നത് അവര് നമ്മളവിടെ സെന്റിമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ദി പാരന്റ്സ് നോക്കുന്നില്ല അതുകൊണ്ട് ഈ ഡിസ്കഷൻ ഇഷ്ടം പോലെ വന്നിട്ടുണ്ട് കാരണം നമുക്ക് തന്നെ കൊടുക്കണമെന്ന് തോന്നും പക്ഷെ കമ്മിറ്റി ഡിസൈഡ് ദാറ്റ് നോ എന്നുള്ള ആൻസർ ആണ് ഡോക്ടർ ബെന്നറ്റ് ഒരു പോയിന്റ് വേറൊരു ക്വസ്റ്റൻ ഉണ്ട് അത് എന്റെ ആൻസറും ഉണ്ട് അതായത് ഈ റിജക്ട് ചെയ്യുന്നതിന്റെ കാര്യത്തിൽ പാരന്റ്സിന് റിജക്ട് ചെയ്യാം പിന്നെ ഒരു കുട്ടിയെ കാണിച്ചു ഇഷ്ടപ്പെട്ടില്ലെങ്കിൽ റിജക്ട് ചെയ്യാം പ്രൊവൈഡഡ് ഹെൽത്ത് കൊണ്ടുള്ള പ്രോബ്ലം കൊണ്ട് റിജക്ട് ചെയ്യുകയാണെങ്കിൽ അക്സെപ്റ്റബിൾ ആണ് സീനിയോറിറ്റി നഷ്ടപ്പെടാത്തില്ല പക്ഷേ ഹെൽത്ത് ഇഷ്യൂ അല്ല കാണുന്നതിന്റെ ഭംഗിയുടെ പ്രശ്നമാണ് അതുകൊണ്ട് റിജക്റ്റഡ് ആകുകയാണെങ്കിൽ സീനിയോറിറ്റി നഷ്ടപ്പെടും സീനിയോറിറ്റി Yeah, that was the point I wanted to raise. Then another thing, Dr. Bennett, uh, we don't have any definite data, but uh, we have uh, an information that uh, illegal or private, I don't, I won't call it illegal, even though it is illegal, private adoptions are taking place more than that of the, that is happening in this state level. If, uh, if we, if we uh, try to streamline and uh, authorize private agencies, in the proper legal framework uh, is it not a better idea that go for uh, le- legally doing adoption in the private sector rather than doing uh, illegal adoption in the private sector anyway it is happening i think it is something we have sir, to work out uh, so, sir uh, this about this uh, actually our awareness is less but actually the private adoption is there it is legally accepted only two agencies are two agencies are there two agencies are there agencies are private adoption agencies yes, there yes. a total in, in our state around 20 adoption agencies are around I mean, it's not a perfect answer but around 20 adoption agencies there in that five adoption agencies are government 15 adoption agencies are uh, private but all the procedures are same for both private and government so it is private adoption agencies there only thing is if you want to get it you should go with that agency and uh, the steps are there no They're like uh, court order has to be there to get a child that has i think i think i think we have to we have to spread the message to the pediatricians also as prashothom sir said somebody comes with a illegal um, idea of an illegal adoption we ask them to go to the legal agency they need not go to the government agencies and they have to have a Uh, private agencies also but only thing is that what is the advantage of that the child will be having all legal rights uh, the, the parents cannot just throw away them and that is the that is the right of the child to have a have a family that is what we have trying to uphold and for that matter we need more and more awareness programs and our our pediatricians i i personally feel that when we come across a uh, couple who are going for prolonged years of infertility treatment we have to tell them that this is an option probably a better option they can go for having a 
uh, 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 good child. I think we, we must, as, as a policy, IAP and the pediatricians to take up it in a big way. And I request Bennett to be a torch bearer for uh, adoption uh, uh, going forward with the uh, principle of adoption in the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My brother also is joined. He is a bishop of Punlur. Yes. Parvati, uh, so many private agencies are doing in, uh, adoption through the proper le legal way. No, isn't it? Yes, sir. Isn't yes, sir. it? So many, especially in. Uh, yes, sir. 15, 15 agencies are there. So that is not illegal. That is legal only. That is no? not illegal. That is not illegal. Illegal means. Uh, Without uh, any. Like, uh, delivery is there in hospital. Ah, yes, I know. Yeah, yes, I know, I know. It was a wonderful talk, Bennett. It was a very nice talk. Thank you, thank you. Uh, sir, my brother also joined. Uh, he will have some words. He is a bishop of Punalu. Oh, oh. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And at, at the moment I am in Goa, that is, and I had a program and I could not attend the whole session. Uh, just now my program is over, so I joined. I am happy about the theme that you have discussed. And I have forwarded your message to many people. <laughs> I appreciate all the resource personnel, this meeting. I wish you all the best. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Any, any case, last moment, Dr. Ashokumar sir, the point was very relevant. Every year, we have a presidential election plan for India. We highlight the organ donation. We have a message for the message. We have a message for uh, when it's other than a torch bear right in the cut and point. And now the Karium, I am following uh, Dr. Praveen uh, Sandar Kumar, sir, and the uh, IMA daily. In the Anangaki, the Pachan, the Alberto, who would knock and Oro, those who in the webinar, highly informative, I'd like the Indian Kondo and the Alberto, who would knock. Tremendous, you the personal life of Margaret, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Fully dedicated, not only this, sir, uh, he is doing the job of our COVID care also with the government. And then, Upam or a YouTube, okay, Narak Narakan does a very excellent idle, informative, and other idle YouTube signing a local garden, the lamp follow in the day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, Bindisha, madam, I can. Wait. Okay, if there is nothing else, we will uh, wind up the program. Thank you, Bennett, sir, and uh, Pradharanda, sir, for the excellent sessions. And uh, thank you, Prishataman, sir, and all the senior members, Parvati, madam, Bishop, for uh, giving the uh, valuable opinion. And also, especially thanks to Ashokumar, sir, for his uh, input. Okay, thank you, madam. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Pradhan, sir, once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Praveen. Thank you, Bennett, sir. Thank you, Vindisha, madam. Vindisha, sir. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.